interview which is a really good one craig richards a uh, resident of fabric and a, just an overall legend in the london djing world and worldwide um went through and did uh, the art of dj with resident advisor probably easily maybe one of my favorite interview series out there uh, obviously being an inspiring dj myself um i like to kind of read up and view or watch DJs that from years gone by listen to mixes and to other stuff but the most important thing is reading the interviews from some of these icons from back in the day and, and you know you can go through the entire archive of RA and kind of read up on all the interviews from all the past DJs and it's always a good insight into how they kind of manage um, collect or picking and collecting tunes um, how they approach their DJ sets, their views on the industry, and just overall just amazing stuff. And I've got some bits of the interview here that I think were really of interest to me that I'm going to pick out here for you guys. Let me quickly just get this up on here before I put this on there. Let's get this back there and there. One bit that I really liked was... Um, Craig Richard spoke really glowingly about the man, the myth of the legend, Ricardo Villalobos, um, who I finally enough discovered, I think, because a friend put me onto him, didn't he? I'm pretty sure a friend put me onto him. So a friend kind of put me onto Ricardo Villalobos, and since then, you know, I've been the I've been that fanboy that's kind of always uh, checking um, YouTube for recently uploaded videos of Ricardo Villalobos playing. I don't know at Sun Waves or whatever maybe. And through him, I discovered Radu, Raresh, and Zip, and all these kind of dudes. So he has been my sort of introduction to a whole bevy of artists. But Ricardo just um, captured my my imagination just because. I think especially when I first got into DJing, it kind of felt a bit robotic. When I first got into it, it kind of felt as if like the people that I was following were a little bit robotic and stale. I didn't really have much personality to them. And once you see Ricardo Villalobos play behind the decks, you finally get to see, oh, okay. You see that, you know, people like him, people like DJ Harvey, uh, DJ Hell, uh, Ron Trent. You finally get to see that there are personalities involved in uh, electronic music or dance music or techno, whatever it may be, right? There are personalities that come with this music, really unique characters, quote unquote DJ rock stars for the most part. And not in a kind of cringy EDM way with fireworks and pyrotechnics, just in the way they carry themselves, the way they put records down, the way they mix, um, their confidence, their charisma, just amazing people. And Ricardo's one of them. And Craig Richards loves Ricardo as much as anyone because he's played back to back with him several times, extended sets sometimes at Fabric. And that's what he said about Ricardo in this interview. Uh, the interview asked him the following Do you remember your first time you saw Ricardo play? And Craig Richards says the following. Yes, um, he's a very different character. He's an incredible DJ, someone who I'm very happy to call a friend. We're in a similar generation. We have a similar record, so it's very easy for us to play together. In terms of character and personality, he's a unique force in the way he plays records. In the right situation, at the right moment, he's unmatchable. I think, and impossible to fathom. The way he puts music together, another incredibly impressive thing about him is the amount of, of music, of his own music he's playing. I played an after party with him recently in Ibiza. I think he played, it was almost all his own music and almost all unreleased and unmastered. His music in some cases made just the week before. For any moment when you're hearing him, you're hearing the product of his creativity and at least half of what he's doing is on his own. It's an incredible thing if you're trying to make your sound your own and half of it is stuff is actually stuff that you've made. And that's something I've realized a lot about people who are at the apex or people that are like the A-star players in their game. They all have this insane work ethic and drive that's just like you know a standard thing for them you think of someone like a future who everyone always says has like a, a bazillion songs in his hard drive he has a million albums he can release tomorrow there is this idea that sometimes you have to kind of uh there is this kind of notion out there that you have to kind of be quality over quantity you can sometimes water them you can cut sometimes um what's that thing called was it water you put it down, water in the market. You sometimes flood the market with too much material. People get bored of you. Um, there isn't any kind of, um, you know, idea of picking and choosing the best things in your collection. And sometimes I think people can get too much hung up on that because you end up trying to be perfect, which you're never going to be. But I think especially in the DJ world, especially in the world where you're playing essentially other people's music, I've always kind of prescribed to the idea that you should be trying to educate yourself on all types of genres in just as much as you can, but also trying to put out so much stuff like content wise and I've, I have, I'm definitely someone that hasn't taken that advice myself but reading this interview has really made me kind of reconsider what I'm doing now you really have to put out a lot of stuff like mixes all the time loads of edits and just constantly kind of putting out content just for the sake of it and I think I want to do that now going forward I have to I have to do that um if someone like Ricardo's doing it it's something that you have to kind of pay attention to isn't it and talking about Ricardo I think the first kind of video that kind of um, gave me uh, my love for Ricardo, one of the first videos, it might have been a video that I kind of saw from Fry 909, I'm pretty sure. 
from back in the day from maybe Ricardo at um, Love Box or Love no Field Day I forgot the thing what is it let me see uh, Ricardo Villalobos uh, Love Family Park I'm pretty sure that's the first one I saw I'm pretty sure of Ricardo playing yeah mate this, this was the first one I'm pretty sure that this was the one this is from Ricardo right I love boxing. I think he's hugging everyone behind the decks. This is just a, the epitome of what Ricardo means to the electronic music space. And um, so, big up uh, FRA909 or FRA909, um, a legendary uh, YouTuber who's kind of put loads of videos out there from loads of different um, events all over the world that we weren't happy, glad we weren't able to attend ourselves. This is what video that goes in. This is Ricardo playing at where? Love Family Park in 2010. So, this is probably the time that I first discovered uh, Ricardo. 10 years ago or so, right? And that's Magda there at the back as well. Love Family Park, I'm sure you guys are aware of. Here's him drinking straight out of a bottle of whiskey. Love Family Park, if you guys are familiar, is the legendary uh, outdoor um, open air festival in Berlin. It ran, I think, was it maybe for close to five years or maybe less? I forgot. At one time, they, at one point, they had like a million people turn out. Obviously, you know, due to um, safety concerns, whatever it may be, they had to cancel it over a period of time. But it was a legendary seminal place. Um, again, you know, an open air party or festival with you know over 100,000 people dancing and you know shaking and driving to flipping electronic dance music is amazing i'm pretty sure the guy with the ponytail here is Svenvar brother no is this ricardo's brother someone's brother this guy is you always see him in videos popping up i think he's their manager or agent or something but yeah just incredible scene But yeah, this is when I first kind of discovered Ricardo, right? And I'll just probably skip it a little bit ahead. You just see him playing the other decks and how charismatic he is. He's such a cool dude. Obviously, loves, loves a hug. He's a master of the hugs behind the decks. He's got the best deck, deck, um, hugs behind the decks game ever. And that uh, and the mixing style when he kind of switches channels is something that I've tried to replicate myself when I DJ. It doesn't work the same way, but his, channels, his channel switch is just... Ugh. So beautiful, man. He doesn't use the crossfade, he just goes dun, 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 dun. like just epic, 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 epic dude, man. It makes me smile just thinking about some of the times I've seen him play, man. Let's put it here. So, that mix. Look at him. just absolute boss, man. Absolute boss. Loads of claps and hula ring. Look at this. This is this is this is essentially kind of what I kind of think about when I hear um I don't know what drum bat patterns this is, but this 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 makes me think of Ricardo. This is essentially the really good version of Tech House, not the kind of that no nav stuff you hear nowadays. But this is what I think of when I hear when I hear when I think of Ricardo, I think of this sound. This sort of like early Nina, but she's sort of changed her kind of sound now. It's probably a bit more acidy, but stuff like this. So good, man. So fucking good. Big fan of his, man. Big, big fan of him. Love this guy. Anyway, so Ricardo, um, Craig Richards loves him as much as he, as much as anyone. So good, cool to see that. Let's go on to another bit of the interview that I really thought was interesting. I want to speak about now. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Get off the screen. What's the other bit I wanted to speak about? Uh, oh, the small gigs one. That was, that was a really cool one. So he's, he's talked about small gigs. I thought this quote was really interesting. Mm, let's see if I can find it. There we go. So. This is something that I've kind of spoke about beforehand, but it's cool to see somebody a bit bigger who, you know, is a bit more famous say it. Because <laughs> obviously it gives me a bit more weight. So there's this, there's this um, question or one of the last questions here at the bottom. Uh, so it sounds like you've got a captive audience. So it says, um, Craig Richards says the following. One thing I've always been aware of is, the, is continuing to play at small gigs and not outgrowing your gigs, which is what sometimes managers and agents seem to suggest you should happen. As your career grows, you outgrow your gigs and there's no need for you to do them anymore. I don't agree with that at all. It's really important that you don't outgrow your gigs in scale and in terms of your wages. If you're going to play a small gig in Eastern Europe or in a small gig in London, there's going to be less money involved. So if as your fee goes up, you choose not to compromise your fee for the experience and for the nourishment that comes with playing at smaller gigs, I think you've made a mistake, really. There's lots of DJs that I know, without mentioning names, who could do with playing the odd small place. It would help them focus a bit, which I 100% agree with. And I think that's something that I really, you really have to respect someone like a Scream for. I think for as big as Scream is, and for as much of a legend as he is, and for as long as he's been involved in the industry, he has still maintained the ability to absolutely destroy a room of 
250,000, 250 people, 500 people, 1,000, 2,000, whatever it may be. But you can still absolutely tear the paint off of a tiny pub somewhere in the middle of East London easily because he's played those gigs week in, week out. He still does them from time to time here and there. I'm pretty sure another big, I'm pretty sure another DJ that's quite popular on Twitter, I think maybe a Michael Bibby or somebody, one of those guys turned up randomly to someone's house party and absolutely tore that place to pieces. So I like this idea that some of the bigger DJs that still have the ability to play those smaller gigs. And I think that's why someone like a Solomon, for instance, who does those legendary Abiba after parties is so good. Because I think he does so many of those he obviously plays, you know, year in, year out. His rep, sets and reps are just insane, the amount of sets he's able to play week in, week out. But I think, obviously, he's obviously an A-star DJ technically as well. But I think the ability to to be able to play after-hour parties in kind of little villas, little Airbnbs in Ibiza for like 100 people, maybe less, is a difference. The difference of playing that kind of set than there is playing to in a bar, right? It's a different kind of ambiance. That will kind of bleed into you understanding how to command the festival stage, which is kind of a hard thing to do. So I think that's something that I've been very cognitive of. And again, I think it is quite unsettling to hear him say that, that some DJs actually get in the industry and then their agents and managers decide to kind of pop them up into, you know, into the stratosphere and get them to play the bigger, bigger places, obviously, because, you know, for the manager or agent, they need to, that's essentially where they make their money on, right? Their 10% fee comes off the back of the person uh, playing bigger gigs. No problem. I understand that. But I think for a DJ like myself or for most DJs that get into it, I would be more than happy to play at smaller venues and get paid, let's say, £2,000 a month to play venues that probably capped at probably 500 maybe 300 and just play them consecutive, consecutively, week in, week out, get better and better at my craft and then maybe do the odd tour around Europe and play maybe the big 500, over 500 uh, capacity venues. I think that is at the that is what the that is what the soul or the heart of what I imagine or what I deem to be electronic music culture is about. I think the DJs that play above that are the ones that are meant to be the superstars. But I think the eco the, the kind of not the ecosystem but the the heartbeat of the industry of the scene are those venues that are two hundred to five hundred capacity. I think anything else about outside of that is reserved for the kind of, you know, the A-listers, the big people, the ones that are always, you know, at the top of the DJ list or the ones that always come out in a higher fee. I think that's fine. But I think the problem that we have is that we have a lot of agents and managers or sometimes booking aid or promoters who are driving the prices up of the guys that should be only playing 500 capacities and down. But, but for instance, I think those DJs would argue and say, hey, I guess, you know, I get it, but there's not enough money in those gigs to make it worthwhile. That's where I think a lot of that money that they try and pay the middle the kind of the second band DJs to play the first band sets should be put more into those DJs at the second band so that, you know, you have a bit of a separation so that when you go to a festival and you go to a big nightclub, you go and see the big DJs play for a change, right? It's quite cool to see that. We sprinkled in with a few up and coming too, but for the most part, you go to the bigger DJ places to go see bigger DJs, right? I'd, I'd imagine like, I would want, like for instance, I wouldn't want the bird kind to turn into like the training ground for up and coming DJs. I'd want you to work up towards that because that would be like your Champions League level. That's the World Cup stage. That's the big, that's, that, that's the, 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 the final level at the game, right? That's where it should be. And then the small the clubs should be the places where you you kind of get your training walls right you kind of you kind of take them off you kind of get better you become a local legend your name your, your name starts to ring because you are the one that's tearing it down at this little uh, you know uh hole in the wall somewhere in the middle of Kreisberg. and then from there you can graduate into playing other places but again i think it's i don't know why that doesn't happen too often maybe again it's because those middle tier djs don't want to play in a place for 300 quid or 500 pounds i get it but I don't know. If that was me, I'd love to do that, man. I'd be more than happy to play four times, a, I don't know, every weekend, you know, Friday, Saturday, at a place, five, pay, get paid 500 quid every every time you play and just tear it up. Like, I'd love that. That would be amazing. That would be the ideal thing to do. You spend a week buying tunes, maybe working part-time, uh, mixing, just engrossing yourself in electronic music, maybe playing Thursday and Sunday even, maybe not Friday and Saturday, getting paid 500 quid to do those sets every week, making your rent, and just living life, do you know what I mean? That'd be amazing. Anyway, the quote continues. Um, one great thing about playing very big places is the crowd is so vast and it becomes anonymous. It's just a sea of faces. It's just uh, a case of concentrating on the mixing and the selecting and just getting it right and not making any mistakes and just doing a good job. In particular, Sona. It's like over 10,000 people. Yeah, Sona was the one, I think, for me, that made me, um, that, that, that finally made me, that finally made me say, I, I don't think DJs are made for festivals in that way. In that, you know, those, not, not festivals like Junction 2, where they're essentially electronic music festivals, which they kind of design a bit different. 
But I think if it's like an indie festival with bands and rappers and stuff on stage, it's not going to work with a DJ. It just doesn't work sonically or visually. Just not the same thing. Having a guy just stand behind a decks mixing just doesn't work the same way especially you went after you've just seen the arctic monkeys completely destroy for an hour and a half right um, it just doesn't work you kind of just you it kind of pales in comparison um so i think but again the money must be so good for these DJs to play at sona things i get it but i think if i'm a music fan i wouldn't necessarily go to a sona to go and see uh craig richards dj i'd go there specifically to see a band and if i happen to bump into ricardo or craig which is cool that, that's a bonus but i'm not going there specifically for them um so it continues here. So I certainly haven't talking about the Tona. So I certainly haven't experienced that much. But if we take the Lion Lamb, the Lion Lamb on oh, Robert Johnson, which I've been to in Frankfurt, one of the best clubs I've been to in my life. Amazing sound. Um, pro probably the perfect size for a nightclub. If I wanted one, I'd have it probably that size. It overlooks the canal. That's like, just beautiful place. Beautiful. I really recommend you check it out. Um, as the opposite of experience, in a sense, it's it's no more complicated. It's just a very different experience. It's more personal, which I agree with. You've got a chance to do something different musically. Some records that you might listen to at home or that are a bit slow or delicate in a bigger room suddenly sound really full, ample in a smaller room. I always take the gig as an opportunity to adapt and to play different things. And it should be that. The idea of just banging it out and playing the same thing wherever you go seems really, really weird to me because it doesn't seem like you're stretching your legs or using your record collection enough, which I 100% agree. I think I've been guilty of doing that myself previously. Now time, well, nowadays, for the most part, every set I play is different from the last. I usually don't ever play the same tune anymore. I usually change the intros, change what I'm playing in the middle, change what I'm playing on the outro. I'm always trying to mix up and play new things just to kind of freshen up and make it interesting for me. And in general, too, I think it's more challenging. It, it, um, I've always, I've always said, if I ever did do stand up, um, which I was, you know, I've always kind of have a plan to end up doing doing stand up comedy. But if I ever did do it, I would never would be the comedian that would go up on there and just have a, a set pre written set that I always kind of that I know murders and do that week in week out. I don't think that's challenging. I would try and make up new bits week in week out and kind of challenge myself on stage just to kind of be a bit more fresh and kind of bring a bit new of a perspective on there. And also, it kind of gives me a better gauge of whether I'm good at the thing I'm doing or not. Because I think if you've got a killer set or you know what works in a particular crowd, it doesn't necessarily mean you're a good DJ right there's no way of gauge whether you're good or not but i think the ability to like play a different set everywhere you play and for it to generally go good or go quite well and people to have a good reception towards you and have come to invite you back again i think it, that's more of an indication that you're maybe getting better as a dj as opposed to just playing the same set again it can be honestly it can be appealing no one i don't think anyone understand unless you're a dj the feeling of fright or dread that comes in your heart when you're standing behind the decks and the song is kind of, you know, it's kind of winding down to maybe the last minute or so. And you don't know what to play next. That dread is, is frightening. Like not knowing what to play, especially when you've got like a crowd in front of you. Like, and it always tends to happen when it's a busier night. When it's a quieter night, it doesn't, you, 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 you just, you, your mind just, you know, effortlessly picks the track after track after track. You've got no issue selecting on a new tune. The moment it's full, the moment you start to kind of garner a bit of a traction and people start to want to come out to see you play, it's suddenly the moment when you don't when you have a bit of a selection mind block or yeah like, like you don't know what to select next it always happens like that it's so frustrating uh, so i love that craig, craig just said that and again it's something that i've always kind of um um done and even now i'm at the stage now where i'm kind of you know playing at that stage where i'm at that you know 100 pounds to 200 pounds bracket of dj then i think essentially when i get the goal is to achieve the kind of 500 pound or 300 pounds or 500 pound uh bit of the djing bit especially week in, week out. I think doing it every month is probably possible, but being able to play somewhere and be trusted to play three times a week, um, oh, no, three times a month, at least at the minimum, will be perfect in terms of, you know, making sure all my nut is covered. And that essentially, for me, would be the perfect place to build from. Because then from there, you can kind of really hone down, um, really kind of zone in on your sound. And then from there, hopefully people see you. You get booked maybe to go to a festival and stuff. And that would be, that would be the experience that I'd like to kind of um, have in a DJ world. And that's where I kind of got in it from. I think the, all the bigger festivals and super clubs and stuff, I think that comes in later. I think there's always time for that to come in. But I think the real enjoyment of it, the real joy that I get from it is being able to travel around the world, travel around Europe and be, play, be able to play these 500 capacity stadium or 500 capacity places. You know, just see the place, see the, see the environment, connect to different people and essentially go and kind of give them or, ex, you know, showcase my musical range to these people that are playing. So you're yeah, cool to Craig Richard say that. 
And um, do I have another bit from the interview that I liked as well? Let me see if I can find another bit that I liked as well. And then we move on. Oh, Houghton. This is an interesting bit about Houghton, which I haven't been to yet, but everyone's saying it's a really cool festival. He has this really interesting point about Houghton Festival that I've got on here. Let me quickly put this on the screen. So, um, let me see if I can find it. Houghton. Mm-mm. Yeah, so this is a bit about Houghton. So, he says the following. Um... When I was at Houghton, um, the interviewer says to Craig Richards, uh, when I was at Houghton, I learned that the DJ booths across the festival sites were standardized so that every DJ had the same equipment. That struck me as very considerate. And I didn't, this is something I I didn't even know this was was not a thing. Um, I guess I should have been aware of this because I remember at Junction 2, for the three DJs that we saw on the main stage, whatever that stage was underneath the bridge, they changed the equipment every three, the, every, every, each time the DJ changed over, there was somebody coming over, like a tech, technician, unplug the decks, put a new deck in, another mixer, whatever it may be, right? There, there's always something happening. And it always struck me as a bit weird that that would happen. Why wouldn't they just have three different stations so that when the DJ rocked up, you could just turn them on and just start playing? But I guess you don't want that kind of equipment out. Maybe someone might fuck it up. Element, I don't know, just probably a, a rationale why, especially because most of the festivals have a massive table where they put the DJ equipment on. I don't know why you wouldn't just have it all out that way, but you know. Um, but it's quite cool to hear that Houghton just have the same setup on each uh, stage. I think maybe that might be because of Craig Richard's background, playing at Fabric, playing legendary back-to-back sets. Maybe he's encouraging that thing where, for the most part, the DJs that come and play at Houghton usually stay, for what I've heard. They just hang out and party sometimes. So maybe... You know, you might see Ricardo Villalba just floating around. He might pop up to somebody else's set and just decide to kind of play some tunes. Um, with them back-to-back, maybe that's the reason why. Or maybe just, just to make things easier so that you don't have technicians running from um, tent to tent. You just have this, the materials kind of... Sorry, the tools standardized on each booth, which is really cool. But Craig would just answer the following. He said, it's funny because I because it seems really obvious, doesn't it? That the booths and the equipment will be well appointed and all working. The glory of Houghton, if there is any, is that I'm just trying to do it properly. The sub the substandard situation in the booth is, I find, unacceptable, which is true. I, I agree. You know what, right? <clears throat> if a DJ like Craig Richards is saying DJ booths are un, un, uh, unacceptable, imagine what he must think when he comes to see me play at the Star of Bethlehem. Or when he sees me come play at the Heathcote and Star. Or when I play at a, a random warehouse party. You should see what I have to put up with equipment-wise. It's never ideal. Ever, 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 ever. Sometimes, so much so when you go and play these kind of places, you're like, why did I even bother downloading a WAV file here? Why? Why? What's the point? I could just rip something off YouTube and it still would have sounded equally as good, right? Um, but again, I think those are good training wars because the, the hope is if you can play on janky equipment, when you get to a higher level, you'll be, you know, you'll be Lionel Messi behind those decks because you, you're used to playing on CDJs that always skip. Uh, the pitch doesn't work. Do you know what I mean? Like, you've never got knobs on your mixer. Bloody hell, man. So imagine if he's saying it's to his level, imagine what he would think of the equipment that pub dudes have to play at. <laughs> the standard situation in booth is I find accept- unacceptable because I know I can perform better if I'm comfortable and if I'm in a space where I can operate I can move and look at my records and the monitoring is good and there's no feedback that's one thing I've noticed too wherever I've been the booth monitor never works I don't know why that is maybe because they don't want to have just extra noise but I never have a booth monitor you always having to monitor from the speakers that are on the dance floor which is you know not 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 ideal um so it's the following i wasn't prepared to do a festival on the festival terms i almost i'm almost creating a nightclub situation in terms of sound system which is very true from what i've seen it's very important to me in a way i'm merely working on what i would be working with it's quite simple so i love that about him um where were you, were there any other shortcomings about club or festival dj that you try to address with how you serve houghton he says the following the length of the set times if you set a situation up correctly you'll create an opportunity for a dj to shine the idea of bringing the best out of someone is really really important we all have to do we all have good and bad days but if you make a situation where the dj is comfortable and where they can do their thing they hopefully you can get the best out of them they will perform happily so comfort is one area but the other thing is the length of time you need time to play the conveyor belt situation in festivals is not much fun yeah we're just coming you know one every hour hour and a half they're just freaking rotating them unless you get it right i know um, how to do it now but when i first had the big festival gigs you had to really hit it out of the ground running and get straight on with it and that's not an ideal situation i like to slowly get into it and bring the crowd with you which is true i think that's that's the beauty of a junction 2-2 or Junction 2 as well, when we went there last year, they did really well to kind of get let the DJs have time to kind of ease into it. Um, every DJ kind of got like a, I think, minimum of two hours for the most part. 
the DJs that started in the earlier in the day got, probably got a bit longer. They played a bit slower. It felt like a nice warm up set. It didn't feel as if like your DJ had to come in and just kind of hit out the park on the, hit out of, hit on the ground running as Craig Richards mentioned. Just start playing all your bangers straight away. Um, like you know, I'd imagine like in a quick like in a quote unquote eats everything sort of DJ set right where you're just playing the bangers straight away and just getting on with. Um, it's quite nice to have that kind of range so that if it eats everything does come on later. You can then he can kind of pick up the mood as opposed to just being beaten over the head with four DJs that are playing that similar style. That's quite cool to hear him say that. So yeah, I definitely recommend you check out Houghton. I might check it out myself, although I'm probably going to go Junction Two again this year. Um, but yeah, really cool interview with uh, Craig Richards. Uh, really interesting, really insightful. Again, I'm a big fan of the Art of DJing um, series that's on Resident Advisor. I think for any up and coming DJ, or any fan of dance music in general, I think it's something you should really keep an eye on and. and and it really gives you an appreciation of the DJs that you follow to see how enthusiastic they are about it. I think this might be one of their longest interviews. He gives very thorough, very in-depth um, answers. He's very considerate and just seems like someone that's really enjoying himself, especially the older he's becoming. It seems like he's even more in love with electronic music than he was when he first started. Let's definitely check it out. A legend in the London scene, one of Fabric's residents for maybe the longest time, maybe 13 years or so, I think, for the most part. I recommend you check it out. A really cool feature from Resident Advisor. <laughs> 